So I'll assume a general uh, knowledge of Palestine, but that I don't really need to say where Gaza is. Um, I usually start off by showing this map, just because some people don't happen to know where the Gaza Strip is, but I will emphasize how small it is and that it's only, again, I, I think in kilometers being in Canadian, um, so it's only 40 kilometers long and 12 kilometers wide at its widest point. Um, and so it's obviously a very small piece of land and there are 1.7 million people um, basically stuffed within that land, locked within that land, uh, two-thirds of whom are refugees. So the refugees are among the poorest of Gaza's population and they also are, are among the people that suffer the most. So for example, even in um, a standard area, I mean this is one sector of beach camp, um, but in general refugee homes are not multi-story, they tend to be just one level homes. Um, very poor construction, very narrow passageways. Many of them don't even have connections to water or sanitation lines. Um, shoddy construction. Many of the roofs are either tin or asbestos. So if, if they're bombed, um, then the roofs, when they break, of course, there's another contaminant that they have to deal with. And asbestos is obviously not good for you. Um, so basically, then, I, since I haven't done an inter introduction properly, although most of you know who I am, um, I spent roughly three years in Gaza since late 2008. I went to Gaza by a boat with the Free Gaza Movement, um, which sailed five times uh, from Cyprus to the Gaza Strip to symbolically break the siege on Gaza because since 2006, Gaza has been locked down under a very harsh blockade that is much more than an economic blockade. Um, Amira Haas was actually on my boat. She's an Israeli journalist who writes for Haaretz and lives in Ramallah in a Palestinian city. Um, and is a very brave and dedicated journalist. And she usually notes that, in fact, Gaza has been locked down since after Oslo, that the Israeli authorities stopped giving permits to the Palestinians that used to comprise a significant portion of the labor force in Israel. They stopped allowing these Palestinians to go out of Gaza to the point where then in 2006, you know, it's the, the crossing is almost utterly closed to Palestinians including Palestinians who have referrals from doctors to get medical treatment outside of Gaza because this treatment isn't available within Gaza. Um, and that's a whole other story in itself. The Physicians for Human Rights Israel has documented testimonies of Palestinians who have these referrals to leave Gaza and how they're interrogated by the Israeli authorities when they try to leave. Um, and often the case is that the Israeli authorities try to coerce them into, into becoming collaborators or informants. Um, so there's one article, if you Google it, Google it, it's called Go Back to Gaza and Die. And basically the premise was that the patient was interrogated, be they elderly or you know young or a child. Well, in this case it was most likely not a child. Um, and when they refused to collaborate with the Israeli intelligence, they were basically told, okay, well then you're not getting a permit, just go back to Gaza and die. So that's um, just to speak of the nature of the control of the borders. So basically then, if you look at the map, um, you can see that, oh, you see the shape of Gaza, kind of bottle-shaped, sort of. Um, and the southern border is controlled by Egypt, it's called the Rafah Crossing, and the rest of the crossings are controlled by the Israeli authorities. Um, the northern crossing, Eras, is the only passenger crossing, and the rest used to be um, goods crossings, but they've all shut down except for one. So the amount of goods coming into Gaza and going out of Gaza have severely um, been reduced. Well, in fact, the amount of goods going out of Gaza are almost nil. Um, every now and then, the Israeli authorities will allow a truck or two out for the sake of saying there are exports. But in general, the exports have come to a grinding halt. And obviously, this is decimating the economy. Um, and then, uh, in terms of the Rafa crossing, so basically, in 2008, when I went, Mubarak was still in control in Egypt. And he was very complicit in enforcing this um, siege on Gaza to the point where he was not allowing most Palestinians to exit by Rafah, which is really the only feasible crossing for them to leave by, um, whether for work in Egypt or abroad, or for study abroad, or for medical care, or for, for the simple pleasure of traveling. It was very difficult to impossible for Palestinians to leave. It changed slightly in 2010 um, after the massacre of the Freedom Flotilla. So basically there were six boats attempting to sail to Gaza and the Israeli Navy and um, elite commandos attacked the boats, both, both by sea and also by airdropping from a helicopter, onto the largest boat, which is called the Mavi Marmara, 
And when they airdropped, they, they basically landed shooting. So um, in the ensuing violence and attacks on the passengers aboard, roughly 600 plus people, um, nine people were killed, including one American citizen, and many, many more were injured. And of course, all of them were taken to Israeli detention. Um, many of them were roughed up, and then they were all deported, of course, and the boats were kept. But thankfully, when I sailed in November 2008, for some reason, we got in without any sort of problem. The Israeli Navy did try to bully us into turning around, but we didn't. And we actually, remarkably, we reached Gaza. Um, and then two more boats successfully arrived, and then any boat thereafter was violently prevented from reaching Gaza. So that was to symbolically break the siege, and, and, and also to challenge the Israeli narrative, which said they no longer control Gaza, they no longer occupy Gaza. Because in 2005, the Israeli authorities had pulled out their 8,000 or so colonists. So after, after that, they said, well, you know, we no longer have a presence in Gaza, therefore we, we don't control Gaza, we have no obligation to the population. But um, groups like, Israeli groups like Beth Salem and Gisha, and many other groups, including Palestinian Center for Human Rights, have documented that, yes, in fact, Israel does still control Gaza. It controls the borders, the airspace, the water. Um, so it has an obligation for the well-being of the people of Gaza. But as you'll see, the policies Israel implements on the Palestinians actually are in, in contradiction to their obligations. They, they, in fact, do everything they can to make the Palestinians' lives utterly unlivable, um, to the point where many people, including myself, are describing it as a slow genocide. And that, of course, applies to the rest of Palestine, too. But in Gaza, it's, it's all the more mm, ramped up, I suppose. So the red line, um, is it possible to dim the lights to make the image a little bit brighter? The red line on the map behind me um, uh, demarks what is known as the no-go zone or the buffer zone or the access restricted area. Thank you. Um, and it is in theory, according to the Israeli authorities, 300 meters on the Gazan side. And in this 300 meters all along the border, um, Palestinians are forbidden from trying to access their land. And if they do try to access their land, they are met with um, a, an assault of machine gun fire or shelling, or often they're abducted and taken to Israeli detention and become one of the 5,000 plus Palestinian political prisoners. Um, and so the people that are assaulted include farmers, include um, children and young men collecting rubble for the purpose of reusing and construction, include people who are um, catching birds, um, for the sake of uh, selling in the markets. And in fact, it, the buffer zone or the no-go zone actually extends to, in some points up to two kilometers, even though the Israeli authorities say it's only 300 meters. And that 300 meters itself is already unilaterally imposed by the Israeli authorities. They have no, you know, no right to do so, but they, it's part of their occupying policies that they feel they can do whatever they want to the Palestinians. Um, so the 300 meters alone already accesses one-third of Palestinian farmland which is critical because Gaza is such a small place and they need to be able to grow their own food and be as self-sufficient as possible. Um, as it is right now, 80% of the population depends on food aid for their survival. And so this food aid basically comprises um, flour, oil, sugar, does not include produce or proteins. Um, so of course this in turn leads to an increase in things like malnourishment, um, chronic malnutrition, um, stunting in children, um, anemia, all sorts of health problems. So, <laughs> the, like I said, the, the buffer zone policy is enforced by machine gunning and shelling. So this is an example of a remotely controlled military tower, um, which is controlled by soldiers who could be as far away as Tel Aviv, for all I know. And they're using a joystick, according to some articles I've read, um, and they're using, of course, the high-precision surveillance equipment that Israel has all along the border. They have blimps, and they have, of course, drones, and other means of surveying um, the Palestinians who are on the land. And so they can see with precision who they are targeting, and they continue to target um, the farmers and the children and the elderly that are on the land. And otherwise, they do so from the standard military towers, or just simply from their jeeps, um, which patrol the border all hours of the day, every day of the week. Um, so in this photo you can see three soldiers who have taken, started firing upon us. In this case we were on land over 500 meters from the border. Um, and this is one of many instances when I was with farmers. We were with farmers and came under heavy um, machine gun fire. But also in the background you can see um, the, the tree line, which doesn't exist on the, the Gazan side. 
and you can see how green, how verdant it is, um, which also doesn't exist on the Gosling side. And it's not for want of good soil, because this is fertile soil, it's the same soil on the other side. It's just because the Israeli authorities have not allowed Palestinians to work the land, to irrigate the land, and they come in routinely and they bulldoze the land and, and tear it up, as you can see. So I'm just going to show a brief clip, um, two different instances were with farmers on land 500 or more meters from the border. This is in southeastern Gaza, in an area called Abbasan, or in, in the, the general area is called Farahin. And just a side note, Farah in Arabic means happy, so it's like the happy place. Um, and it is a happy place. I mean, the people there, of course, are lovely. It is beautiful, but it's, it's not happy in that it's, it's routinely assaulted. It's one of many areas that are routinely assaulted. So in the video, um, you'll see some farmers pushing a pickup truck. And if you watch just the front of the pickup truck, you'll see one farmer as he's shot and falls to the ground. So I just note that because it, it does happen pretty quickly. <laughs> escorting him off the land. That was after we had come under um, heavy assault for about 40 minutes. Um, the bullets literally whizzing past, as you heard in the video, um, to the point where no matter what we did, whether we stood with our arms up, whether we tried to back away, the army kept on firing at us. And we were finally able to edge backwards slowly, um, take cover behind one of the many demolished houses in the border region and then finally um, escort the farmers in small numbers, in groups of two or three or one, off the land to a point where they could take cover behind a home, that uh, a one-room shelter. And the army nonetheless continued to try to fire at us behind that shelter. Um, so they were aggressing us simply for the sake of aggressing us. Um, thankfully, nobody was killed that particular day, but in the other instance in the video, this was the guy that was hit. So Mohammed was from a, a large family in um, Venezuela, in southeastern Gaza, and he's an example of the segment of farmers who actually are working as farm laborers. Um, so he's basically just trying to provide some sort of income to his large and very poor family. But after his injury, he said, I asked him, are you going to go back out? Because many farmers are, are injured and they, they return to working because they're so desperate to earn an income. But he, he said, no way, are you crazy? I'm not going back out there. Um, and his cousin Anwar actually, three weeks prior to that, had been killed when he was shot in the head by, again, by the Israeli army, on basically on similar land, so 500 meters away. Um, and of course, you saw in the video how flat the land is. I mean, it was once abundant with fruit and olive and nut trees, and it was a very lush and rich place. But now it's, it's almost completely desolate. So in terms of security in the Israeli narrative that um, they, they're shooting back, they're shooting so-called warning shots at um, security threats, 
there's no basis to that because first of all, even with the naked eye, even with my poor eyesight, you can quite clearly see who's on the land and what they're doing. Um, also, of course, the Israelis have high precision technology for surveying. And also in the video, I mean, you saw that the farmers were pushing a pickup truck and they had their sides to the army. And this was after two hours when we'd been on the land. Um, the army had stopped and watched us, left and come back, etc. And they only chose to shoot after we were, we were leaving. So we'd even retreated more from the land and were busy, they were busy pushing the pickup truck and that's when the army fired. So clearly um, no security threat. And just on another note, there were occasions when you'd see the soldiers get up on top of their jeeps and pose, look them at the Gaza border and take their trophy shots. So if they're really threatened by these unarmed Palestinian farmers, you know, you don't, you don't expose yourself to potential danger. Obviously they're not fearing any danger. Um, so when Anwar was killed, he left behind two young boys and um, some elderly parents, uh, his elderly parents, and an extended family, which he had been supporting. Uh, these are just some examples of some of the farmers who come under fire. So the army doesn't discriminate between elderly, young men, children, women. Everybody's a target. And in terms of children, um, Defense for Children International, which you can find quite easily if you search it on the net, has documented very well um, the targeting of children, um, not only just in Gaza, but it, in all of Palestine, but with regards to Gaza, it has documented very well the um, both maiming and killing of children who are either farming or working in the border region collecting rubble or, as I said, catching birds. Um, so again, children, you can see that they're unarmed, but the Israeli army nonetheless does target them. So, what's that? Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, I, I'll just show you this other brief clip. And the reason I show this is because both to highlight the desperation of people in Gaza because they have been rendered so desperately poor. So for example, I mentioned, I think I mentioned that 80% of the population is dependent on food aid. Well, in 2002, it was only 10%. So in just over a decade, this has skyrocketed. I mean, in fact, the 80% number has been so since about 2006 or seven. So the closing of Gaza's borders, the destroying of their factories, etc., has caused this drastic increase in poverty and, and food aid dependence. So um, in this clip, it, it tells the story of a young man named ah Ahmed Abu Hashish, who was from Beit Hanun in Gaza's north and from a very large and poor family, and basically was so desperate to try to um, earn an income and help his family out that it's believed he was trying to sneak to Israel um, to get work when he was killed. Uh, so his father one day Ahmed goes missing and his father doesn't hear from him for a number of days. Um, he suspects that probably his son has tried to sneak into Israel because he's so desperate and still doesn't hear from him. So after a number of weeks he's starting to really worry. He starts asking around and after, um, well, I, I'd say like um, five weeks, a shepherd contacts him and says, I think I, I smell something rotting in the border. He had been hurting his flock and he smells something. Um, so the father tries to get in touch with um, some bigger international organizations, including the Red Cross, because they're the types of groups that can get coordination with the Israeli military to access border regions and hopefully not be fired upon. But according to the father, they either didn't reply or they replied to the negative. So then he got in touch with a group in, in the north, a group of really brave Palestinians who do a lot of community work in the, in the border regions and repeatedly expose themselves to the danger of being um, killed or maimed by the Israeli army and also got in touch with us, the ISM. And so this video just shows us looking for the sun's body and finding it um, and just the intense gunfire we come under even though again uh, there's one woman in the video saying we're looking for a body, it's very clear what we're doing, we have our hands up in the air and the father and the shepherd are actually with us as well. So um, just to give you a sense of what it's like. This father is just so desperate to find his son's body and bury his son and have some sort of closure and the army is even attempting to deny him of that. Oh, <laughs> no. 
Israel's security, um, just a young man who out of desperation was trying to perhaps sneak into, the, into Israel to find work. Um, but at least, as I said, at least the father was able to bury his son and get some closure. And when we visited him a few months later, he was at least at peace. And this is something that not all Palestinians get because often when their loved ones are killed by the Israeli military, they're kept, the bodies are kept and they're often not returned. Um, in some cases they are returned, but years and years later. So uh, just imagine how you would feel if, if somebody that you loved was murdered and you couldn't even bury that person. Um, but again, on the note of targeting civilians, uh, this girl, Wafa, went back to her home in, in the border region in Hoza. Um, her home was 800 meters from the border and she went back following the 2008-2009 Israeli attacks on Gaza. And as she stood next to the rubble of her home, um, 4,000 homes, by the way, or, or more than 4,000 homes, were completely destroyed by the Israeli army during those attacks, and 16,000 were severe to mildly damaged. Um, so it was one of the homes that was completely destroyed. So she's standing next to the rubble of her home, 800 meters away, and a soldier kneecaps her. So again, um, what kind of threat did she pose to this soldier that he felt he had to fire on her? Or she felt, depending if the soldier was female. A farmer who was on his tractor, um, trying to work on his land again after the attacks and the army opened fire on him, shooting him in the backside. And then this boy, um, Ashraf, he's an instance of both targeting by the Israeli Navy and the Israeli army. So basically the Navy was firing upon um, Israeli, or Palestinian fishers who were only about a mile and a half or two miles off the coast. And the Navy gunfire is even more intense than the border gunfire that I saw, um, which is already intense enough to begin with. And so Ashraf started running because he was um, afraid of being hit. And so he started running and ended up running towards the northern border from where a soldier then started firing upon him and shot him in the neck. Then the soldiers entered, uh, because there, there are gates all along the border, so they entered through one of these gates, came up to Ashraf, told him to get up, and according to his testimony, he said, I can't get up, you, you just shot me. Um, and they kicked him in the body, in the face, um, this is according to his testimony. His face was bloodied when I saw him in the hospital, so it seems like something was done to him. And then they took him to the Israeli side and basically denied him medical care and didn't return him for about an hour to the Palestinian medics, at which point he finally got medical care. Um, but Ghazi did not survive his, his fatal injury. He was on land in the northeast. 500 or more meters from the border. He was with his family. They were just checking out the land, their, whatever crops they might have on the land. And so he was shot by an Israeli soldier and didn't survive. So then I, I mentioned the story of this farming family, Jabber, because his story, their story, Jabber and Leila, and their seven or so kids, is the story of many small farmers in the border region who have been assaulted and devastated and had their land destroyed. So if you see in the right-hand side of the, the photo there, you can see the remnants of what was a functioning chicken barn. And he had about 2,000 birds. And in May 2008, during the evening, um, one night, the Israeli army invaded, so with tanks and bulldozers. And they destroyed the however many you know, hundreds of trees he had and his crops. And they also threw some sort of explosive um, devices into the chicken barn, killing all but two or 300 of his birds. Um, and then on a, just on a regular daily basis, they fire at the house, um, they fire at the water tank on the roof, they fire at the seed dryer he had on the roof. And so you know, every little aspect of damage means that they're, they're basically destroying his ability to exist and, and provide for his family. But then they invaded again in May 2009, destroyed more land, and then in May 2010, um, you can see the remainder of the chicken barn there. Um, they came in and completely bulldozed it. And 
So he had some farming equipment inside the barn, and he also had some crops. Not, not a whole lot, but whatever he was able to eke out of the land, the very small amount of land he's now trying to work, um, he had those stored in the chicken barn. So when they bulldozed the barn, they also bulldozed the crops into the ground. So this is the third major incursion, the third time his family was devastated. And not long after that, the family actually left the home and started trying, renting a home um, in the town, but further away from the border, because his kids were so traumatized. And they couldn't even afford to pay the rent because they, all their sources of income had been completely destroyed. So they were always on the verge of being expelled from their home because the landlord obviously needs some money for his own family. So again, his is just one of many um, small farmers' stories. And just bearing in mind that not only is it impacting on their own lives and their own ability to provide for their kids and for the kids, you know, psychological well-being, but also their ability to provide um, inexpensive and healthy produce on Palestinian markets in Gaza, um, which obviously is impacting on the whole health um, sector. This is the story of two sisters that lived on land 700 meters from the border in roughly central eastern Gaza. So when the army came in randomly one day and destroyed their olive trees, and they had, I believe it was about 100 olive trees, around 70 years old, so not as old as some of the ancient hundreds of years old trees that Palestine has, but of course the Israeli um, army has destroyed the majority of trees, in, certainly in Gaza. Um, so having a tree that is 70 years old is, is significant, let alone having 100 of them. Um, so they lived off the, the oil and the fruits of their trees, and they had some fruit trees as well. And they sold it, and that was their income. And the army destroyed their trees, their home, and two neighboring homes. So in the case of this neighboring home, the family, like so many other families, when their house is destroyed, had nowhere to go and tried to continue to inhabit the home, even though it's obviously at risk of collapsing at any point. So every week or two, the army invades under the cover of these, the tanks, obviously. In this case, there were four tanks and four military bulldozers. And they sweep the land, they ravage the land, leaving behind a wake of destruction like this. Um, but in the case, of, in this particular instance, we were standing on the roof of Jabber's home, which he says is 480 meters from the border. He said he used Google Map or satellite or whatever it is. Um, and yes, his, the furthest eastern point of his home is 480 meters from the border, so technically outside of the so-called 300 meter no -go zone. But nonetheless, as we stood on the roof, the bulldozer closest came within about 50 meters of the house, so definitely outside of the, the Israeli-imposed no-go zone. Um, and so he didn't have any crops planted there, but the, the bulldozers continue north to south, so they're hitting areas where farmers have taken the risk of planting on their land, and they're destroying it, like this farmer. Um, so he's already lost land to the other side of the border, back, you know, in 67, and then he's lost land to the um, buffer zone, and now he's, even though he tries to plant on the land that's technically outside of the unjustly imposed buffer zone, um, even then, his land can still be destroyed. And then another thing the army does is throw some sort of incendiary devices on the crops so that even if the farmers are successful at planting and then um, growing their crops, in this case, for example, they were just a week or so away from harvesting, so they never got that chance because the, the incendiary devices that were thrown on their crops basically destroyed them. And this is something that happens routinely, the farmers tell me. But also, not only that, but um, the Israeli army has destroyed their water sources. So if you cannot collect rainwater, um, because it only rains for a very short period in Palestine, or sometimes people would have a whole extensive series of hoses and pump water to holding pools, which they would then use to irrigate their land. But if you can't even contain that water, obviously you can't irrigate your land. So since 2005, over 306 wells have been destroyed. I'm sure it's more, um, because that statistic was as of 2012, I believe. So I wouldn't be surprised if more wells have been destroyed since then. And then um, I'd like to talk about the, the fact that Palestinians do know about nonviolent resistance, even though many people in the corporate media would say otherwise. They would have you believe that Palestinians and Arabs in general are just hate-filled, um, you know, weapons-carrying, etc and that they don't know how to, to call for their rights um, in other ways. And, I mean, an occupied people have the right to resist however they see fit. It, it, it is um, 
it's the right is not by people. But I think it's important to note that Palestinians do also, in addition to other legitimate resistance, they do also hold nonviolent demonstrations. And they have wide participation of women and elderly and children and young men and young women. Um, but that all of these people are also fired upon by the Israeli army, even though it's quite clear what they're doing. They're singing and they're dancing, they're waving their flags, they're putting the flags on the fence, and they're saying, this is our land, we're not going to be run off our land again. But um, even though that's quite clear, the army does fire upon them. On numerous occasions, when I was at these demonstrations, as I was there and I saw people get injured by live ammunition. They don't even bother with tear gas when it comes to Gaza. In Belain and other places, they use a mixture of um, heavy-duty tear gas canisters or high-pressure tear gas canisters, um, thinly, uh, th uh, like metal bullets coated with a thin sheaf of rubber and live ammunition. But in Gaza, they just start with the live ammunition. Um, so in the case of this guy, Ahmed Deeb, he was shot, uh, targeted in his pulmonary artery, and he's an example of somebody who, if you don't get medical attention in the first, I think it's 10 minutes, you bleed out because it's an artery. And that was the case with Ahmed because the ambulances cannot come to the areas in the border region where people are being injured because the ambulances are also targeted by the Israeli army, even though that is also quite illegal. Um, so the ambulances, because they have to be able to rescue other people, they won't take that risk of going so close to the border. So if somebody is injured, you have to transport that person by any means possible to a point where an ambulance can then pick them up and, and get them medical care. So in, with the case of Ahmed, he wasn't able to be transported quickly enough, and he's just one of many people who have been killed in nonviolent demonstrations and injured. And then we come to the sea, where the same kind of policies are enforced on Palestinian fishers. And again, even in the sea, the machine gunning is, is more, um, in my experience, more brutal. And also, the limitation on what they can access is even harsher, because under the Oslo Accords, they were granted the rights to access 20 nautical miles of their sea off the coast, but the Israeli authorities have again unilaterally um, imposed restrictions to the point where they're only allowed to fish within three miles, so 15% of their fishing water. And even then, the Israeli Navy attacks them even a mile and a half or so off the coast. So you have a whole population, 3,700 fishers, who are now forced to fish in a very small area of water where there's almost no fish because the fish are beyond seven miles, the, like the larger fish and the migrating fish are beyond seven miles. So really, um, if they're confined to six miles or three miles, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference because there's not a whole lot of fish there. Um, but then in addition to that, not only they're confined to that space, but they're attacked whether they're at three miles or two miles or one and a half miles. So they're attacked by heavy duty water cannoning. Um, and sometimes there is a chemical compound they put in the water cannon so that when you're sprayed with it, you smell like excrement for several days. And they're attacked with heavy duty machine gun firing. So in this case, the boat came under fire for about 15 minutes, according to the fishers. And then if you see in the upper right hand corner, um, then it was shelled. And with the shelling, it caused to catch a fire. And by the time it was towed back to port, it was completely um, ravaged. So the eight or so fishers that were working on that boat suddenly were without in a source of income, a source of work, as was the boat owner. And they could not replace the boat because they can't, they're, they're again part of Gaza's most direly poor. And also the replacement parts are banned by the Israeli authorities. They don't allow many things to come into Gaza. For example, from the imposition of the siege until about 2010, the Israeli authorities were banning all but 40 items from entering Gaza. So they were banning the most mundane things like um, paper and pens and diapers and baby formula to more critical things like certain medicines um, and things that farmers and fishers and everybody, and, and daily people need for their lives, um, including raw materials for factories and diesel and cooking gas. So again, back to the fishers, if they can't, um, if their vessel is destroyed, then they're basically out of work. Um, and this kind of thing happens all the time. And in, in addition to that, the Israeli Navy often abducts fishers. So they'll catch them, they'll enter into the so-called fishing limits, and they'll order the fishers to strip down to their underwear, dive into the sea. They're often made to swim or to tread water for varying lengths of time, 10, 20, 30 minutes. Then they're hauled aboard the Israeli gunboat and taken to Israeli detention, where they're interrogated about everything except fishing. They're interrogated about 
where their neighbors work or where their buddies work or what their father does. And in fact, the fishers have told us that the Israeli intelligence know every single one of their vessels and every, every fisher. They're simply being, um, again, it's psychological warfare, it's putting pressure on them, of course, un unfair pressure. And they're, they're, they're trying to force the fishers to become some sort of collaborator. Of course, the fishers refuse. Um, but usually the fishers are released within a day or two. Um, sometimes they're roughed up and their boats are always kept. And if the boats are even ever returned, it's often after long periods, months or even a year, and the boats are usually stripped of all equipment and badly damaged. And on top of that, the fishers have to pay for the return of the boat from the Israeli port back to Gaza. So it's an assault on fishers and their means to, again, provide for their families and provide affordable um, protein to the Gazan market. So I'll just show you a brief clip to show you an idea of the heavy duty assault that fishers come under. And bear in mind that when they go out, often they need to stay out for an entire day. So if they're assaulted and they're able to escape the first assault and move to a different area, then they often come under assault again and again and again. So it's an um, it's incredible, um, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's very, um, sadistic game of cat and mouse. I arrived in November 2008 and the other activists had been there since August and they've been going out from the very beginning and documenting this kind of thing. Um, so I went out once and then the next day that we were to go out accompanying fishers there's a demonstration um, at the Arrows Crossing, um, a demonstration against the siege. So we decided that some of us should be present at the demonstration and at the time I think we were only about seven or so people so we kind of split up in half. Three went out with fishers and four of us went to the demo. Um, and that particular day, it turned out that the Israeli um, Navy had arranged, um, organized to abduct uh, all of us or whoever was on the sea because they basically encircled the three different fishing vessels um, the three internationals were on and not only attacked them with the regular gunboats, but they also had special Zodiacs with elite commandos on the Zodiacs and, you know, much larger numbers than they usually use to attack the fishers. So they basically boarded all the different vessels. Instead of making the fishers dive off into the sea, which is the normal procedure, they actually boarded the vessels, arrested everybody on board, or detained everybody on board, and took them to detention. Um, of course, kept the boats, and then deported the internationals, and released the 15 fishers. So in a way, it was lucky that some of us were at the demo, because otherwise they would have, um, they would have basically nabbed all of us. And I think it's, the reason I mention this is because this was, um, it would have been mid-November. So from November 4th, the Israeli authorities had kept the borders closed to, to aid, to aid workers and to journalists. And then I think that in, in light of what happened in December, the, the attacks on Gaza, that they were really trying to clear all witnesses out of Gaza. So again, fortunate that some of us were actually able to stay. And in fact, the, the strange thing is that Free Gaza was able to sail another boat into Gaza, so a few more activists arrived into Gaza before the attacks began. But um, I'll just talk about the siege briefly, well not briefly, because it's a huge encompassing issue, and it basically, um, the siege is um, impacted by these attacks on farmers and the attacks on fishers, um, and of course the wars that Israel wages on Gaza in which it bombs not only homes and everything it can possibly find, but it, it attacks businesses as well. Um, and then does not allow the construction materials back in in order to rebuild. So you have an increase in children uh, of school age who are working to support their families doing whatever they can, whether it's collecting rubble for, um, for construction uh, purposes or whether it's collecting plastics, recyclings, or selling trinkets on the streets. Um, 
And at, until recently, there was what was known as the tunnel industry. And so by some estimates, there were, there were even over a thousand tunnels um, snaking underground um, over top of one another beside each other uh, with very little room in between, meaning that the walls were actually not very um, stable and they were prone to collapse. Um, and also another aspect of the difficulty of working in the tunnels is that the wiring was often faulty so that people would be electrocuted. Um, and also, of course, the Israeli Air Force would bomb the tunnels. So at last um, estimates that are statistics that I saw, at least 230 Palestinians were killed while working in the tunnels. Um, but these tunnels were bringing in all the, the items that were banned. And they were also even, in some cases, exporting some of the goods that were banned from export being exported. And I, I even saw human traffic going through the tunnels in terms of people who could not get out through the Rafa crossing, um, business people or people going for medical care. Um, but unfortunately, as of July last year, 2013, the, there was a military coup in Egypt and it's kind of returned to the um, Mubarak era um, military control of Egypt and also therefore control of Gaza and imposing of the siege on Gaza in, in, in line with Israel. So. Uh, with that, the Egyptian military has, has largely destroyed all of the tunnels, meaning that all the goods that were coming through the tunnels, which one report I read said was 40% of Gaza's needs, um, including, critically, industrial diesel. All these goods are not coming through any longer. So these were some of the things that were being exported through the borders, but now are not. And the reason industrial di diesel is so essential is because it was used to fuel the, the, the sole power plant in Gaza. So the power plant itself used to provide, um, I think it was 43% of the Strip's energy needs, but it was bombed in 2006 by the Israeli Air Force. And after that, the Israeli authorities did not allow in um, the import of the transformers to rebuild the power plant. So through the tunnels, as I understand, Palestinians were able to bring in smaller transformers, which were not of adequate size to generate the, the electricity needed, but it was better than nothing. Um, but they also, of course, needed the fuel to run the power plant. And so that's not coming steadily through the, the borders that Israel controls. It was being bought from Egypt and imported through the tunnels, but now that is largely stopped. So over the years when I've lived in Gaza, the kind of normal situation has been, you have power anywhere from six to eight hours and then it's off six to eight hours, and then it's on. So it's kind of um, timed power outages to ensure that throughout the strip people get at least a little bit of power. And then in more dire circumstances when there wasn't enough fuel to run the power plant, it was more like power was off for 12 hours or 15 hours or 16 hours. Um, last year, the crisis was so bad that power was off in November and December for all but four hours, and then in December it was all but two hours a day, some days no power at all. So this impacts on all aspects of life, including um, sanitation. So in terms of sanitation, Palestinians cannot treat their sewage for a variety of reasons. They don't have the actual facilities to do so. They haven't been allowed to expand their sanitation facilities. Again, construction material and other things that they need to come into Gaza, the Israelis ban them um, from entering. So their solution is, instead of having sewage flow into the streets, they pump it into the sea. That's all they can do. So they were pumping it into the sea, and this is an example, this is from Gaza Valley, um, at a rate of 90 million liters a day. But um, when they cannot pump it in, into the sea, for example, when they don't have the power to do so, then it overflows. So this is an example from 2007, when it overflowed into um, a Nasser village, flooding the village and killing four people, drowning in the sewage, including a baby. Um, and so then, similarly, in December last year, there was a combination of this drastic power outages, the inability to pump the sewage into the sea, the sewage accumulating in, in the um, inadequate sewage holding pools, and then unseasonally heavy rains. So the combination of this meant that in many areas throughout Gaza Strip, the streets were flooded with this combination of rain and sewage water. Um, and then going back to the refugees, the, you know, two-thirds of 1.7 million people, they're hit the worst because they live, for the most part, in these one-level dwellings, which are flooded with this sewage rainwater. So for weeks, um, they had no means of pumping the sewage water out of the street, so they had to either wade through it, or if they were lucky, they got a ride on one of the Fisher's hassakas. 
So then, not only does the sewage affect the, you know, the, the homes and the sea, and of course, bearing in mind that fishers are fishing within three miles off the coast, the fish that they're catching tend to be contaminated with this sewage water, but it also impacts on the drinking water because it's now seeping into the coastal aquifer. Um, the aquifer itself is grossly overextracted. That's their only source of, of drinking water. The Israelis do not allow Palestinians access to the mountain aquifer in the West Bank. Um, so, therefore, the population is dependent on this one source of water. Um, when I lived in Gaza, I could afford to buy the clean, I hope, um, drinking water that Israel sells to Gaza. But I'm not one of the 80% who lives on less than two bucks a day, so those people can't afford to, to buy drinking water. So they end up drinking the water that comes from the aquifer, which is contaminated and which is, by WHO standards, 95% undrinkable. So, of course, then this leads to an increase in waterborne diseases. So that's about the siege and the health sector and the poverty and all of this is, that has been manufactured. But on top of that, on top of these, these horrible situations um, that most, most of us couldn't live through, then Israel randomly um, wages wars on Gaza. So in December, on December 27th, Israel began a bombing campaign. But in, in actually in the weeks leading up to that bombing campaign, the Israelis were already bombing Gaza. They were already violating a ceasefire truce that had been um, enforced in mid-June and it was to last to mid-December and the, right from the beginning the Israelis were, were shooting at Palestinian farmers and fishers, they were violating Gaza's airspaces, airspace with their F-16s and their drones, releasing sonic booms and even randomly bombing places but uh, this was not largely re reported in the corporate media. What you would only hear was um, Hamas for its part actually restrained its resistance fighters from firing any of their um, pathetic little um, homemade rockets into Israel, um, but that wasn't really reported. Uh, on November 4th or 5th, the Israeli army um, assassinated, I think it was six Hamas leaders, or Hamas members, I should say, um, and this is again before the, the all-out war on Gaza began. And then some days later, they bombed another area, killing a child. So there were a number of bombings before their official war began. But on December 27th, um, at around 11.25 in the morning, a time when people were on the streets, um, it was, you know, streets were very busy with people going to, to shops or kids coming or going um, to and from school, the, the Israelis bombed throughout Gaza, hitting, targeting police stations throughout Gaza. So in the first day, there were hundreds had been killed and hundreds and hundreds more were injured. Um, and the whole Israeli narrative was that they were targeting strategic strikes on Hamas so-called terrorists. Um, so by targeting police stations, they said, you know, this was legitimate. But the people that were working in the police stations were traffic um, police, they were law, civil law enforcement, and they potentially actually worked for the previous government, Fatah, when it was in power. Um, so obviously it's, it's a completely ridiculous reason, um, and it's not legitimate that Israel could just randomly bomb police stations. And of course, when they bombed the police stations, they were hitting everything that was around it. So businesses, schools, hospitals, mosques, etc. Um, so then, within the first couple of days, I went to the Shifa Hospital, which is the main hospital in Gaza City. I went to their ICU because, as part of the documentation, I thought it was important to see who the injured were and what was the nature of their injuries. So this is just one example. Um, and by the way, when the nurse walked me through the ICU, he said that 90% of the people there wouldn't survive because they had critical injuries. And in a way, this was a good thing because there were so many more critically injured that were just lying on hospital floors waiting for a bed. And the ICU was not equipped to handle all these, this influx of casualties. So as soon as somebody died, um, the bed was cleared and one of the people lying on the floor would be put in the bed, etc. They didn't have enough life support machinery to keep people alive either. Um, and just in the lead up to the attacks, they were already suffering shortages of medicines. Like it's been consistently over the last seven years of essential medicines, it's varied from 30% to 50% at zero stock. So they were already um, severely ill-equipped to, to deal with normal health issues, let alone this massive influx of casualties. You're told from Sarah again. Uh, he was uh, injured yesterday by bombing of uh, Israeli planes F-16 when he was in, uh, walking to his house near the mosque called Al Farouk Mosque. Uh, the Israeli missile uh, hit 
in the Amunar building. Amunar was a politic man. Uh, the boy was returned to his house. Uh, even he uh, stopped to be close to the mosque, the, he injured, and the injury was in his head. Head trauma, massive uh, head injury, uh, and shrapnels in the foot, shrapnels in the back, shrapnels in the back. And not uh, in the head, the patient is unconscious now, under sedation connected to the ventilator and uh, under sedation his, his case is too critical, too critical. So he was one of the lucky ones to be connected to a ventilator but there were some patients in the ICU that didn't, couldn't even get that um, so it was just a matter of time before they passed away. And the nurse said in that that the boy was walking near the Farouk mosque when it was targeted because the Israelis were targeting what the nurse said was a political man. So that's just an example of Again, the Israeli narrative being they're doing targeted strikes on so-called terrorists when in reality what they were doing was bombing every single place they could bomb in Gaza and it was not targeted. It, there was a lot of um, collateral damage, like this boy. So we started accompanying Palestinian medics because um, already in the first few days the Israeli army had killed medics and of course this is illegal medics have their you know they should be protected and they should be able to access those who are calling for help but in the case of Palestine in all of Palestine I mean I saw this in Nablus as well um, medics are targeted and they're prevented from accessing the people who are calling for help and actually somebody who was um, a former US vet or who is a, a US vet I should say um, he told me and I hadn't thought of it this way he said that when you kill a medic and I'm not sure if his statistic is precise, but it, the idea is right. When you kill a medic, then you're therefore killing 50 people who would have had medical help. So by targeting medics, they're actually, they're, it seems like the Israeli goal when they were bombing Gaza was to kill as many people as possible, um, inflict this, you know, the various uh, means of punishment that they're inflicting on, on Palestinians in Gaza. Of course, this is to the extreme, killing and maiming them. Um, so because they were targeting medics, we thought, well, company medics, and maybe we can ensure some sort of safety and ensure that they can reach people who need help. And also, we can document the worst of Israel's war crimes, because it was quite clear there would be many. So this is a one of 34 mosques that were um, destroyed um, by Israeli bombings. Another 200 of Gaza's 800 mosques were, were damaged to some degree by bombing. And in this case, this was the Ahmad Akal Mosque in Jabalia. And so, again, with its, its destruction, nearby homes and businesses were destroyed or damaged. And the, the five girls from the Belusha family who were sleeping in a room next to the mosque were killed in their sleep. Um, there was another mosque that was bombed, and I believe nine people were in it praying when it was bombed, and so they were killed. And then, of course, it's widely documented that Israel used white phosphorus in Gaza. And this is a really interesting point. I mean, it's, it's a horrible point, but it's interesting in that, um, so I personally saw evidence of white phosphorus in the north, in the east, in the south, um, and of course, this, the bombing of the Fakura school, in which 43 people were killed, is well documented. But Israel has not been held accountable for this action, and uh, you know, using a chemical weapon like white phosphorus is criminal, and it's illegal. Um, and the whole Israeli narrative that they're using it as a smoke screen doesn't hold because they were using it in densely inhabited areas. Um, yet you have, you know, when it comes to Syria, you have allegations that the government has used chemical weapons. And then the allegations were actually not proven to be true. And in fact, the, the evidence pointed towards the rebels having used um, chemical weapons. But nonetheless, swift action was taken upon the Syrian government to the point where um, the US and NATO were ready to bomb Syria. But when it comes to Palestine, where there's actual documentation, nothing is done. Um, also, in the same day that they bombed Pakur, they also bombed or shelled uh, the deep homes. So another nine people were killed by white phosphorus. Then the next day I went to the cemetery um, to pay my respects to the families of the people who died in Pakur. And they even, though they were trying very you know, quickly and desperately to bury their loved ones, couldn't really finish the mourning process because all the while, of course, the F-16s were in the skies, um, the drones were up there, it was psychological warfare, you know that at any moment you can be bombed, 
And in fact, a tank that had invaded from the north started shelling towards the cemetery. So people had to basically run, and you know they didn't have the time to finish their mourning process. This is another instance of a home that was bombed, again, with white phosphorus. So this was from the Abu Halima family. Um, their home came under repeated shelling. They were from Atatra, which is in the um, Beit Lahia in the northwest. And at least one of the shells was white phosphorus. Um, so this mother was badly injured. You can see the burning on her arms, her legs, her face. She was holding her baby Shahed, whose image you will see. And I, um, I apologize that it's, it's very hard to see. But on the other hand, I don't censor these photos because as I always say, Palestinians don't have the, the ability to censor what happens to them. And I think it's our obligation really to see what they're suffering because it's largely unreported in the corporate media and this enables Israel to keep on doing what it does. So anyway, the mom was holding Shahed, um, the baby, when the shell burst in on their home. So Shahed was burned alive. Um, her, the mom's daughter-in-law was badly burned and later I learned she died of her injuries. Her daughter Mara survived but mutilated, disfigured, and this is Shahed, who the medic um, which found her said he'd been a medic for about 20 years and it was the most horrific thing he'd ever in encountered. And in Gaza, I mean, medics encounter a lot of hor horrific things, but obviously of, you know, babies by white phosphorus is, is as nasty as it gets. So this is just an image of how intensely white phosphorus burns. And then to give you a sense of how it's just impossible to put it out because this chemical keeps burning until it's deprived of oxygen. And it's on a human being especially, it's, it's very difficult to smother a burning human being and deprive the, the flames of oxygen. So we just did a little test. Okay, you see? Okay. Yes. Well, it's not. No, it's not. It's, it's still burning. Okay. It's still burning. Okay. It's still burning. That's something. That's something. You can see from inside. Yeah. So basically, each shell contains something like 130 or so sponges, and they're saturated in this chemical weapon. That's why um, when he poured water on it, maybe he for a moment uh, it extinguished the fire, but the core of the sponge is still saturated with the chemical, so you just poke it and introduce oxygen and boom, it, it lights up again. And somebody from the mines advisory group that was in Gaza to detonate the unexploded ordinances told me that she had seen or she knew of cases in Laos, which also apparently was bombed with chemical weapons, white phosphorus, that um, it can lie dormant. If it's smothered, it can lie dormant for decades, posing a risk to future generations. Um, in this next video, the man on the far right in the brown jacket, I show this because his wife was murdered by a drone strike and it was an example of a double tap in which you bomb an area and then a few minutes later you bomb it a second time, so therefore you hit more people that have come to rescue. Um, so they bombed just outside the, the man and the wife's home and she went outside fearing that a, a neighbor or a sister or somebody had been um, injured and she was hit in the second bombing. But also, um, you notice that the man is actually helping to, to collect bits and pieces of his wife and carry her because the, the bombings were just so incessant and there weren't enough medics everywhere to, to do the work. And also, his grief is so raw. And this is something, again, that I feel the corporate media doesn't show, that Palestinians are actually human beings and they actually do feel and they do suffer. And his wailing is some of the most, um, yeah, the m most horrific wailing I've ever heard. I mean, he's just suffering so badly. So I, I just think it's important that people feel that. This, uh, the man in the middle, his name was Arafa Abdeldayim. He was another amazing medic uh, for about 10 years. I worked with him one night, really great sense of humor, wonderful person. 
um, the evening that I worked with him, the American high school in the north was bombed. And although we went at night and tried to find any survivors, we couldn't see. And of course, it was extremely dangerous because nighttime, um, F-16s and drones above you. So we came back at first light, and we did find the young night watchman who had been in the school when it was bombed, and brought him back to the morgue. And by the way, the morgues themselves also were overflowing with bodies and couldn't cope with the number of um, corpses coming into the morgues. And then um, I went back to do some reports from Gaza City because the whole Gaza Strip basically was without electricity. We were both at the same time trying to document what Israel was doing to the Palestinians and, and ideally be a part of the, the reason that people on the outside would be outraged and put pressure on their governments and therefore put pressure on Israel to stop bombing. Um, and we we're trying to do like so we we're documenting but also share that information. So while I was in Gaza City, Arafa went on another call. And as he was um, at the end of his ambulance, he just loaded somebody into the ambulance. It was shelled with a dart bomb. So a dart bomb basically has roughly up to 5,000 razor-sharp little darts. Um, they're designed, when they're fired, if, they're, if they burst in the air, they're designed to kind of spray in a large arc. Therefore, they'll hit as many people or, or objects as possible. In the case of Arafa's murder, he was hit directly. The ambulance was hit directly with the dart bomb. So he was basically just studded his body just torn apart by these darts. So he went into shock and died shortly after, uh, leaving behind, of course, children and a wife and parents. Um, and then, of course, um, another aspect of the cruelty is that uh, Israel repeatedly bombed mourning um, ceremonies. So basically, in the uh, Muslim-Palestinian tradition, when somebody dies, the following day they erect, erect a mourning tent, um, and people from the neighborhood or from the family come to pay their respects. So in the case of Arafa's murder, they erected a mourning tent, and it was actually shelled with a dart bomb. So more people were killed and injured. And the, I read reports of this repeatedly happening, and it still happens even if Israel's not waging a war on Gaza. They bomb um, mourning ceremonies. This is another instance of attacking medics, of course, an illegal and criminal act. Um, Hassan on the left and Jamal on the right were collecting a corpse, which uh, I don't know how long it had been there, but on the road, on the other side of the road, behind them or in front of them, the Israeli army had invaded and was occupying the neighborhood as Bidab Rabo. And so, as Jamal and Hassan tried to gather the corpse, of course, you can quite clearly see their medics. And incidentally, this was the first day of a day of the days in which Israel said there would be three hours of ceasefire in which they would not attack people. So, as medics are carrying this corpse in ceasefire hours, they come under sniper fire. And they still try to continue carrying the body, but finally have to just drop it and run for their own lives. So thankfully, his injury was not fatal. Um, he was out of commission for a couple of days. But like most of the valiant medics there, he was back at work um, as soon as he could. And many of the medics that I talked to had repeatedly been injured, either by gunshot um, injuries or by shrapnel, like Ahmed, who has his legs are just kind of rippled with um, scars from shrapnel or gunshots. So in the end, uh, the Israeli army killed 16 medics, um, killed over 1,450 Palestinians, over 5,300 injured of varying degrees of injury, including severe life-altering injuries, um, destroyed tens of ambulances, bombed hospitals. So this is the al Rehabilitation Hospital. I actually had a friend in the hospital at the time in which it was being bombed, and the staff at the hospital were trying to coordinate through, I think, the Red Cross or someone, to tell the Israeli army, please don't bomb here. We have 70 invalid patients here. There's no reason to bomb. There's no security threat. And they continued to pound the hospital, including with white phosphorus. And then, of course, um, after the ceasefire, so the ceasefire was negotiated, uh, it was on the 23rd day of the attacks, and the Israeli army continued to bomb even after the ceasefire. So, which is why I always say it went on for 23 days. And then I went around trying to document the immense destruction. Um, there was so much to document, and everybody had a story to tell. And I also noticed that, or I was told that, in many cases, houses, especially in the border regions, were destroyed by dynamite or some sort of explosive. So it wasn't just like an, an accidental or collateral damage at 16 but also very intentional uh, demolition.
So many people had to live in tents. Um, there are, I believe, still people living in tents even now, so many years later, because they cannot rebuild. They either don't have the money or the construction materials to rebuild. They don't have relatives to stay with. Um, I'll just play this to give you a sound of a sense of what the sound of a drone is like. And this, by the way, is on the first day of the ceasefire. So obviously, the drones still in the sky, and F-16 still doing flyovers. one or two drones, you can hear the wavering pitches and just imagine how that would get under your skin. During the attacks, of course, I don't know if there was hundreds, but certainly it was like a multitude of drones um, wavering intonations. It was really, it was psychological warfare in addition to the very real warfare Israel was committing. Um, so as I, I took people's testimonies and heard their stories, went through their homes, of the homes that were occupied by the Israeli army, most of them were vandalized. In many occasions, there was hate graffiti left on the walls. In many occasions, there was excrement smeared on the walls or in cupboards. Um, and many people had their valuables looted by the Israeli army. And interestingly, I read an article, and I'd have to do a bit more research, but this one article said that of all the war crimes, including shooting children point blank, um, shooting people point blank, and white phosphorus, etc., and dime and depleted uranium, of all these war crimes, apparently only one Israeli soldier has been um, held accountable for having stolen a credit card from one of the homes they occupied. This was something that came out after the attacks. Um, I don't believe it was officially sanctioned by the army, but nonetheless it was quite popular in Israel for a while. One, it said one shot, two kills, and you see the one on the right hand side. Um, is uh, an image of a child in the sniper's scope. So this boy is an example of many of the victims um, who actually survived a dart bomb attack but could not have the dart removed from their bodies because uh, in many cases they're too deeply embedded and the, the hospitals in Gaza just don't have the precise equipment to do so. So many victims just have to live with the darts in their limbs or in their chest, etc. And then later in, in the course of my time there, I, I visited different trauma centers which were doing art therapy with kids. And these are some of the drawings that kids were um, producing. Of course, um, I have heard accusations that this is just propaganda, that adults drew these drawings, but that's a bit ridiculous. Um, I did see them in many different centers. And in fact, there was an exhibition that was traveling called A Child's View from Gaza, and it had uh, similar drawings to this. So um, after the ceasefire, within a couple of weeks, uh, well, within the first week, Israel was already shelling, the Navy was already shelling at Palestinian fishers, resulting in the injuries of people that were walking on the beach. And in the case of this boy, um, Ahmed Hassanin, he was standing outside his home in eastern Gaza, and he was shot in the head by an Israeli soldier. Um, and the prognosis was not good that he would survive. <laughs> So, um, as I mentioned, in the lead up to the December 2008 2009 attacks, there were random um, bombings, etc. There was also, you know, attacks at the beginning of 2008, there were attacks in 2007, there were attacks afterwards. There's, Gaza is a place that can be attacked at any point, and even to this day, Israeli authorities are threatening, you know, we're going to wage another assault on Gaza because of reason one, two, three. Um, so it, it's a, a place where people are unfortunately very used to the sounds of F-16s and drones, and children can actually name warplanes and they can <laughs> name Apache helicopters. Um, but in November 2012, they waged another fairly major war. It was eight days this time. But in fact, even before the beginning of that war on Gaza, they began by assassinating a Hamas leader who was largely seen as being um, a broker towards some sort of peace with Israel. So they assassinated him. And they also killed a kid who was playing soccer in eastern Gaza. And then they killed, they attacked a mourning, um, uh, people mourning in a, either in a tent or at a, a graveyard. So there were a number of attacks which occurred before the actual eight days of attacks began. But um, yeah, the eight days were similar to the 2008-9 attacks. 
This time, I don't, they didn't use white phosphorus, and I don't believe they used depleted, depleted uranium, but they did continue to attack anywhere, including schools, um, mosques, again, kindergartens, etc. But the two cases that were most profound for me were the two kids that I saw in a central Gaza hospital who were killed within hours of a ceasefire that was, had been agreed upon by Israel and Hamas. And it was to be implemented at 9 p.m. And so within the last few hours, the Israeli army actually ramped up their attacks, bombing even more heavily. And so Reham was in a, in a home in Nusarat camp. And so the, a shell was fired um, just outside the home, and she was hit in the head with shrapnel. So by the time she arrived at the hospital, she was pronounced dead. And um, the one that really got me was Nader, who was about 14 years old. And he lived with his family in eastern um, Deir el-Bala, so central eastern Gaza. And he basically, when he heard there was a ceasefire going to be implemented in about two hours, he asked his father for money to go to the store and buy food for his siblings. And the father gave it to him, so another went down the lane, and shortly thereafter there was an explosion. So the father ran out and looked up the lane towards the store and was looking for his son to come out of the store, thinking, and he, hopefully, his son made it to the store. But in fact, he realized he was standing at the heap of his son's body, lying on the ground. So uh, he basically called for help, nobody heard him, and then he just embraced another and passed out and woke up in the hospital um, where I met him, and he learned that his son had been killed. So then, um, some days later, a friend and I went to the family's home to meet with the family and hear the story of how his son was killed. And the father showed us, he told us the story, he showed us the lane where his son was assassinated just two hours before the ceasefire, at the bits of the bomb that he had collected. So you can see there's some sort of chip there. Um, it looks likely that it was a guided missile from a drone strike. And so this is important because, again, the ceasefire was to be implemented, and nonetheless, the Israeli army, with their precision technology, chose to assassinate this boy who posed no threat to them. And I, I just think that um, seeing the son's mutilated body totally broke my heart, but also just knowing the sadistic nature that they wanted to kill as many people as possible right down to the last minute. And even after the ceasefire was implemented, there were reports of bombings. Um, so then one other aspect of Israel's targeting of Gaza, aside from the decimation of life as, as Palestinians know it, you know, under the siege and the attacks on farmers and fishers, is that whenever they bomb Gaza, they intentionally destroy the infrastructure. So I was told that this is the third time that the coastal bridge had been destroyed. It was out of commission for about three months because it took quite that long to get the materials and to rebuild it. So it meant that for myself, I was living in central Gaza, so to get to Gaza City, normally I would take this road. So that the only other choices now were to go quite far east and take this, the main road, um, Sal Hadin Road, which was very congested um, with the additional cars coming from the western coastal road, or to take a detour through Gaza Valley, which is one of the areas through which sewage is pumped. So this 15, 20 minute detour is not a pleasant one. And also in certain times it was quite bumpy. And so if, you're, if you need to get to Gaza City quickly, um, it, it could be dangerous or fatal. Um, and otherwise it was just an inconvenience. But not, but not only that, they also attacked the water lines, the sanitation lines. They did this in 2009 as well. They attacked another bridge, destroyed another bridge in the interior. They attacked schools, including UN schools. So all of this is important because Gaza is already hobbling along under siege, and now they can't even rebuild what is just recently destroyed. So then, of course, after the ceasefire in November 2020, uh, 2012, uh, shortly after, the Israeli army was attacking farmers again. And I mentioned that I had a friend in the Wafa Rehabilitation Hospital. This is him, Abed. And he was injured in the early 2008 attacks. And the reason I mentioned his story is because his injury, which was a sniping in the back, in the spine, which rendered him bedridden, um, even though his, his body has recovered somewhat, he still can't walk, his initial injury has led to all sorts of internal organ problems. And I just think it's important to recognize that um, injuries, when we hear about injuries, they, they can be quite complicated and, and most certainly life-altering. And the number of injuries in, in Palestine is just um, incredible. But finally, I, I end with just showing some nice scenes. Not that it's going to make life in Gaza any nicer, but I think it is important that people know um, just how 
amazingly resilient people are in Gaza, in all of Palestine, but specifically Gaza, because it is one of the most bombed and most um, uh, locked down places on earth. In fact, many people describe Gaza as the world's largest open air prison or the world's largest concentration camp, including people like um, Hedy Ipstein, who's a ho Holocaust survivor, and other Holocaust survivors have said that as well. Um, Palestinians strive for education. They're very cultured. They're very um, resilient and, um, what's the word I'm looking for, innovative. So, for example, when the Israelis were banning cooking gas, Palestinians started using um, their old kerosene lamps, uh, babours, to cook over. And then the Israelis started banning um, kerosene from Gaza. But they always find a way, even though it's, it's the most impossible circumstances, they somehow find a way to exist. Um, again, in circumstances that most of us could not tolerate. And even though, you know, they are loving and very generous and very humorous, actually, but despite all of these great qualities, nobody can live under the conditions they're being forced to live under for much longer. The UN has already said, in terms of Gaza's infrastructure, by 2020 it won't be a livable place. Um, and so these people are being forced to live under such conditions. and. At the same time, they're still being denied the right to export, the right of freedom of movement, and Israel is still threatening to wage more war on, on Palestinians in Gaza. So I think it's really important that we do what we can, um, raising awareness, talking with people, not being afraid to talk with people, not being afraid to, um, to tell the truth and be challenged on it, um, because it's the very least we can do. They're, they're suffering. They have voices. They have very articulate voices but most of our media will not acknowledge their voices, so therefore the general population doesn't know. And then in terms of the states, I mean, we're sending billions of tax dollars to Israel to wage these atrocities. So I think there are actions we can be doing. Uh, some people engage in boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Some people make a point of protesting the fact that America sends so much tax money to Israel. Um, and other people work on really educating and, and holding workshops or demonstrations. So I'd just like to end with that note that we should all be doing whatever we can to change this um, impossible situation because really it could be changed very quickly. Open the borders, allow exports, um, allow necessary imports, and don't bomb Gaza, don't target fishers and farmers. And they could be uh, very much more self-sufficient and you know, poverty would decrease and unemployment would decrease and they would live at, at least um, the, the basics of life which they are being denied. Thank you. Soundtrack, clap. <laughs> so, any questions? Comments? Oh, you want me to do it? So, just really, um, you know. Thank you. Yeah. I've been getting, um, I know it's, it's winter time and it's hard to get crowds out, but I have been getting decent, I mean, in terms Good. of people who come out to hear something like this, crowds, and people are, um, even people who know about, you know, Palestine and Gaza specifically are just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I didn't know. Maybe you mentioned last night at UB, you got like 60 people? I think so. I'm, I'm not the best estimate, but I was trying to count as I was doing Q&A, and I think it was about 60 people. And what kinds of comments do they make, and questions do they have? Like, um, most people are are sympathetic. Again, most people say, like, I knew it was bad, but I didn't know it was that bad. Many people are appalled at different aspects, so some people are appalled at seeing farmers being shot at when they have absolutely nowhere to take cover, or fishers, etc. Um, some people are appalled at, you know, the, the situation with sanitation and water. There are some people that try to defend Israel's policies and ask about Hamas rockets. But I mean, clearly, when you consider the power imbalance, like just the arsenal that Israel has, and the fact that the rockets from Gaza are largely unguided um, homemade rockets, you know, and they can't inflict the damage. I mean, even if you then get gruesome and look at statistics, it's something like 24 Israelis have been killed over the last 10 years by rockets, whereas, you know, thousands of Palestinians have been killed by Israel's um, weapons of war, in Gaza specifically. So, and then the other, just the other point is that um, there may be stray, like Hamas for its most part, and I'm not saying that I defend Hamas, but they were elected, they never had a chance to be a proper government, 
and for the most part they have been restraining their own factions from firing rockets. And often when there are rockets fired, it's not by Hamas, it's by other particular factions. And it's even sometimes questionable, have they, is, it a, is it a false flag? Have they been instigated to fire so that therefore Israel has its excuse, even though it's not a legitimate excuse? Um, but even if it weren't the case, even if it was like a genuine act of resistance firing the rocket, it still doesn't mean that Israel has the right to bomb the whole population of Gaza, right? So that's usually how I answer. And, and anyway, like um, I'm just sharing my experiences. So the the people that are pro-Israel tend to be very few in numbers. Um, some of them tried to bring up other things like suicide bombings or something, um, which don't occur anymore. And if they do bring it up, then I just mentioned that people can be driven to acts of desperation when they're put in such horrible circumstances. And these different policies that Israel inflicts on Palestinians are genocidal policies. I mean, it is, as Ilan Pape says, it's an ethnic cleansing policy. I just want to thank you for your courage mm -hmm. that you went there, because um, I'm aware that there have been activists that have gone there that haven't returned. And that should be said. And um, thank you for going there and bringing this film and telling the story. Welcome. I get that a lot too. I mean, there's a lot of people doing this, and there's a lot of people doing solid work on the ground here because it's not easy to be an activist here either. I know there's a lot of pressure from the the different um, pro Israel lobbies, but. Um, welcome. Thank you. I mean, it's I I can't even say you're welcome because it's just. Like Brian going to Palestine, it's, you go there because you want to know, you want to be able to witness it yourself, and then you want to be able to affect some sort of change. And when you're there and you see the Palestinians suffering in the various ways they suffer throughout all of Palestine, it's like, it's just in your, you know, you can't do anything but um, advocate for them, right? Mm -hmm. You can't see it and not advocate. And there's probably a difference too in, in terms of how um, Israeli activists, once they're identified as Israelis, were treated by the Israeli army? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah they, they, again, with Belain or other other areas where they take part in either nonviolent demonstrations or direct action, like removing roadblocks from Palestinian roads or cutting down illegal fences, um, they are targeted by the Israeli army. And in fact, in one of my talks in Boston, I met a Jewish man who apparently was a rabbi, and he went with a group, not ISM, but a group similar to ISM, International Solidarity Movement, um, he went to Palestine to stand in solidarity with Palestinians, and he said the Israelis won't let him in anymore, and he's Jewish. So it's, it's kind of interesting that if you, if you even have a whiff about you that you might um, stand in justice or for justice for Palestinians, then it's very difficult to get into Palestine. And some people at, at the talks ask, like, how did I get into this? And it's just, it's not a very interesting story. It just basically comprises me going from not knowing anything about Palestine to suddenly having some facts presented to me. So, it, it, you know, in, in my case, it has nothing to do with having ties or religious beliefs. And, you know, it's just about like, wow, this is really glaringly obvious. <laughs> well, what advice would you have for uh, people who haven't been there yet who might be interested in going and taking part in bearing witness or other activities? I would say if you have the means to go, absolutely go. There's various ways. I mean, some people don't want to do the more um, uh, personal risk kind of activities that ISM or Christian Peacemaker Team does. Um, but there's a lot of ways to bear witness, even simply joining one of the um, solidarity tours, you know, whether it's ICAD, you know, they do tours about Israeli house demolitions, or there's other faith groups that do tours, um, talk, you know, talking about how different areas of the West Bank and Jerusalem are oppressed. Um, there's different levels of intensity if you want to go, but certainly if you have the ability to go, absolutely go, because then you'll see the truth. I mean, you, you can't go and not see the truth. And I think it's, for me, it was life-changing. Um, and I think most people I've met who have gone, it, they've said it's life-changing. I'm curious about the Israeli army. Um, they, they have a mandatory, everybody has to serve, right? Mm -hmm. And is it two years, or do you know how long they serve for? I think it's two years, is it two or three? Uh, it's, I think it, it's like three, 
for men, and then I think it's a little less for women. Um, but then you serve your whole life, like you can get called back uh -huh. whenever you're always in the reserves. So. Uh -huh. And do you know, I mean, is there like an intensive training that they do before they go out? or? Um... I don't know much about the training. I know that with Gaza, they tend to send some of the more extreme soldiers, uh -huh. soldiers that are more willing to enforce these policies. Uh -huh. But I'm not sure about the training. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, I guess that's what I'm worried. Though, what I'm curious about is because they just seem so, right, extreme. Mm -hmm. That if that's just like if everybody's serving and like you know like what, you know, where is that attitude coming from? I guess because Israel lives under constant threat also, and that's the dynamic that I was speaking. That it's not a duality mm -hmm. of Israelis versus Palestinians, Palestinians versus Israelis. It's the Western world, what we've done to that continent, it's profit-driven, it's corporate-driven, it's fundamental extreme religion. Israelis also live under the constant threat of bombing and attack um, from forces regarding that continent. They're not being, you know, in regards to the Palestinians, what's occurring. But there is a lot that's fueling um, what is happening to Palestinians. I, it's I, not I as simple as just. That, I mean, right? I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, uh, Iran has never attacked any country. Um, Saudi Arabia, which is sending these Wahhabi extremists to Syria, which is decimating the country, has never attacked these. These Wahhabis have never attacked Israel. If they so-called hate Jews, you know, why haven't they attacked Israel? Not that I'm advocating for them to, but I just I don't really buy into the whole Israel is under constant threat. I, I don't believe it actually. Oh. I'm not meaning to be um, contradictory, I'm just saying I, I don't believe that's the case. I think that their people are told that, and that, that's what, I mean, it's just like here in the States, we're told, um, I, I was born in the States, so I can say we, um, we're told, you know, Al-Qaeda wants to kill us, right? I mean, that's the, that's the prevailing message, like that Muslims, you know, don't like our freedoms. Um, and many people buy into that. Many people don't, thankfully, but I don't really think, I think, I think that there is a lot of propaganda in, in Israel, and I, I mean, I've had Israeli activists say this, that there's a lot of propaganda saying that, you know, Jews hate us, or, I'm sorry, not Jews, um, the world hates Jews and Arabs hate us. And even I met with Israelis that formerly were part of the army, and now are part of this group called Combatants for Peace, and they, they said, they, they said, um, they were, and like this one guy, I remember him telling me, he, in 2007, he said, I wanted to kill any Palestinian, or he didn't even say Palestinian, he said any Arab, I was ready to kill 200,000 Arabs if it meant it guaranteed my country's safety. And then he finally had this turning point when he had his um, gun trained on a four-year-old kid or something, and he realized that kid could be his own kid, and he finally like humanized the Palestinians. Um, but he was saying, like, I grew up being told they want to kill us, and I wanted to defend them, or my country. So, there's that. There's a lot of propaganda in North America about you know the nature of Arabs. It's been the Western influence of what we've done in okay. the Middle Eastern continent, yes. and it's been occurring centuries. Yes. Um, and I'm just trying to tell you that in my view, it's not a duality of just Palestinians and Israelis. Oh, agree. Um, and there's extreme differences in the Middle East. It's not just Arabs and Muslims. There's multiple sects of Muslims, there's multiple sects of Arabs. They all have their own history, um, and um, it's not a duality. And yeah. that's, um, and Jewish persecution is very real, oh, yeah. and it's very recent from their perspective. Um, and when you have, you know, Western influence coming to that continent, as our conservative president chose during 2011, um, to you know, really try to attempt to conquer that, you know, and in my view, it was profit driven. Um, that's impacting the Palestinian situation, and I guess that's the point um, I'm trying to make. That what we do in the Western world, the supposed free world, um, but yet we have all these blinking lights, impacts what is happening, you know folks internationally, but it's specifically the Middle East in oh, yeah. the Palestinian situation. No, I, I agree with you there, um, for sure. And um, I guess that's the only point. I don't think that demonizing 
you know, all Israelis is the answer because I know many Jews that have fought decades for a Palestinian state. Oh yeah, and I um, and, and really worked very hard in Israeli, you know, culture and here. Yep. Um, and um, I guess that's the only what I'm focusing is that you know the real problem in my view is what the Western world has done to that comment and what yep. we're doing to that culture. And we're creating this duality, and by responding with a dual perspective, um, that's the only thing I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah, no, I um, hope I didn't demonize Israelis. I'm, I'm talking about Israeli policies, and that some people... The military. The, the, the government, I mean, the policies, I mean, to the point where they calculated just how many calories Palestinians in Gaza needed to survive and not quite starve. I mean, that's a sadistic policy, that's a genocidal policy. The policies of, of telling their soldiers that they can fire upon the Palestinian farmers and fishers at will or to fire upon them. I mean, the many fishers told us that the Navy said to them, when the foreigners are gone, we're going to kill you. I mean, they, they, they practically do kill them anyway, and they, they, they have killed at least nine fishers. Same with the farmers. Uh, in at least one case, when I was with farmers, the army was firing upon us and they, they said, we're going to kill you next time. Um, so, I mean, that's just, it's policy. Um, and then some, I, I'm not going to say extremism, because that word is used out of context so much, or it's twisted, but some soldiers that, um, just like US or any soldiers, when they're put in a very dangerous area, I, they go, they flip a switch and they have no qualms about killing or, you know, committing these horrible, cruel acts. But yeah, I mean, the, the average Israeli person, I know many good Israeli activists, and I've met good, obviously, Jews of, of conscience around the world um, struggling for justice. So definitely not trying to demonize Jews or Israelis, but I the government. You are. I'm, just, yeah. I'm just trying to interject that yeah. dual, dual thinking is, because I just think it's a lot, the problem is much more complex. Mm -hmm. And obviously, what's happening to Palestinians is wrong. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the interesting thing is that I often say to people, um, in terms of what's happening to Palestinians, it's not complex in that it's it's black and white. You know, they were ethnically cleansed, they were occupied, and they are still occupied. The colonies are growing, and you know, then of course the various things that Israel does to Gaza. So in that sense, it's not complex, but then it is complex in that there are various powers meddling in what's going on, and the U.S. and Canada. I mean, Canada is not innocent by any means. We're, we're super pro Israeli in terms of our government. So. When you were there too, um, uh, what was uh, Palestinians in Gaza's um, opinions on Hamas, whether they be pro or critical, simply because the whole pretext for you know Israel continuing this uh, massive brutality is the fact that Hamas was elected in Gaza in 2007? Well, I think um, people were sick of the corruption of Fatah. Right, yeah. Um, so Hamas was the only other real option, so they chose Hamas. Not everybody, of course, supported Hamas. There was, I believe, significant support in the early years, but I think that support has dwindled um, because Hamas is also has its elements of corruption, unfortunately. And that's the whole thing. Like, I, I don't really speak about the, the internal politics because I don't consider myself well informed enough, but I do think that from friends that I've spoken with, they feel like they don't have actual representation, that each party is in it for themselves, just like it happens here, of course, right? Sure. <laughs> or anywhere. Um, so I don't think there's as much support for Hamas, but then what's the alternative? I mean, you have a boss who's really closely aligned with the Israeli authorities and ready to sell off the country, basically sell off the rights of return or rights regarding Jerusalem. So not a whole lot of options and that's the thing like they're suffering under the different policies and under, under their own poor representation as well I just um, read something interesting about the detention centers in Israel and how um, it's not also it's not just Palestinians that are being detained but also a lot of other immigrants trying to come into into Israel um, and trying to work and I don't know if you have any um, thoughts or about that at all to feed me? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't have a whole lot of information. I know that when I was deported, I was um, in a cell with an Indian woman, like from India, I mean, and um, 
couple of Filipino women. Mm -hmm. And in their case, they had just, not just, but they had overstayed, they had overstayed their visas for about five years. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think there are a lot of people from Sudan who would try to um, enter Israel as refugees and end up in the detention centers, but I don't know a whole lot about it. Do you, Brian? Uh, a little bit about the Sudanese. I know this one group. I can, uh, I can do it tonight. Um, not so much. No, I never worked with the, with the refugees. Cool. All right, well, hmm? we get off the stage now. <laughs> <laughs>